My homily during this service is in honor of Matthew P. Taylor. Matthew died this past week at the tender age of 40, a seminarian who was a friend to many, many of us who are in UU leadership. It was a shock to all who knew and loved them. In the words of Rebecca Savage, Reverend Rebecca Savage in a visual in honor of Matthew just last Wednesday, the world has no idea what it has lost. Indeed, Matthew had a huge and loving heart and a generous spirit. And I had the privilege and honor of knowing and spending time with Matthew when we gathered at in-person events. I, along with many, many others, will miss him, miss them dearly. We are stardust. I want to begin by sharing uh, words that I first read a few years ago, came across my social media that I heard just yesterday at a memorial service for another friend who died uh, a few months ago. It is by a Black writer, performer, and someone who studied physics, even though they also went on to do stand-up comedy, Aaron Freeman. Aaron wrote in 2005, you want a physicist to speak at your funeral. You want the physicist to talk to your grieving family about the conservation of energy so they will understand that your energy has not died. You want the physicist to remind your sobbing mother about the first law of thermodynamics that no energy gets created in the universe and none is destroyed. You want your mother to know that all your energy, every vibration, every BTU of heat, every wave of every particle that was her beloved child remains with her in this world. You want the physicist to tell your weeping father that amid energies of the cosmos, you gave as good as you got. At one point, you'd hope that the physicist would step down from the pulpit and walk to your brokenhearted spouse there in the pew and tell that all the photons that ever bounced off your face, all the particles whose paths were interrupted by your smile, by the touch of your hair, hundreds of trillions of particles have raced off like children, their ways forever changed by you. As your widow rocks in the arms of a loving family, may the physicist let her know that all the photons that bounced for, from you were gathered in the particle detectors that are her eyes, that those photons created within her constellations of electromagnetically charged neurons whose energy will go on forever. And you'll want the physicist to explain to those who loved you that they need not have faith, indeed, they should not have faith. Let them know that they can measure, that scientists have measured precisely the conservation of energy and found it accurate, verifiable, and consistent across space and time. You can hope your family will examine the evidence and satisfy themselves that the science is sound and they'll be comforted to know your energy is still around. And to the law of conservation of energy, not a bit of you is gone. You're just less orderly. When I was growing up, one of the few things that I kept with me from my Muslim upbringing was the idea of Allah, God, as energy, a source of all that is and ever was. Now, the concept of Allah was never quite explained in these exact words to me. My mother would simply say, Allah is not a person, Allah is light. I grew and moved away from the beliefs of my childhood and embraced Unitarian Universalism. One day during coffee hour at the very first brick and mortar congregation I joined in New Jersey, someone asked me, what positive aspects of Islam did you keep with you? And my knee jerk reaction was nothing. I may have even made that exact face. The person looked at me and pressed on and said, hmm, it couldn't have been all bad and something must have impacted you in a positive way because look at you today. It gave me pause. We are the sum of our experiences. And what I realized after having to think about it for a while is that there are two things that I hold on to from my Muslim upbringing. 
my commitment to social justice, and the idea of Allah being energy and light and not a person. Internalizing a deity not as a person but as an energy source has been strangely comforting to me. I experience this energy as one of the expansive universe and the stars and the galaxy and the seemingly endless sky. Behind me is a painting that hangs in my home. I hope you can see it a gift to myself as I navigate this phase of my life. A friend of mine who is an artist, I commissioned her to create this work and she calls it Asia's Big Sky. I gazed upon it often and tried to meditate on the expansiveness that I am invited to. And especially because I live in Seattle and quite often the night sky is cloudy and I don't often get to see a clear, expansive, starry night. The expansiveness of the universe used to feel frightening to me. Humans are so small and insignificant compared to the wide universe. Does our existence even matter? I don't feel insignificant anymore. When I think about the universe and human, humans place in it, what I've been learning is that our energies are connected. We are part of the source and ultimate energy that some call Allah, some call God, some call the spirit, some call the source. Rather than experiencing the expansive universe as big and vast and wide and unreachable, I now experience this expansiveness as part of who I am and who we are. We are all connected. I started reading a book this week called The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time and Dreams Deferred by Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein. She is one of fewer than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from the Department of Physics. I wanna thank Lucretia Williams, our own learning fellow for letting me know about the book when I was telling Lucretia about this week's sermon topic. I will one day preach from this extraordinary book which weaves the story of the universe and quantum physics with the story of enslaved Africans, black liberation and white supremacy and how science and even the study of science is not and has never been free of white supremacy culture. Here is a quote from the book in the chapter titled, In the Beginning, A Bedtime Story. I believe we can keep what feels wondrous about the search for a mathematical description of the universe while disconnecting this work from its historical place in the hands of violently colonial nation states. With this book, I hope to map out for myself and for others an understanding that creating room for Black children to freely love particle physics and cosmology means radically changing society and the role of physics within it. In the end, I have two dreams for Black children and others besides clean water, good food, access to health care, and a world without mass incarceration. One, to know and experience Blackness as beauty and power. And two, to know and experience curiosity about the night sky, to know it belonged to their ancestors. Well, I've already gotten to some of the pages of the science that I don't think I'll ever understand. The parts that I am engrossed in is when Dr. Prescott Weinstein talks about Black feminism and how she was raised by Black feminists, and she even quotes Alice Walker. What I love about our Unitarian Universalist faith is the invitation to expand our imaginations and connect the dots of who we are with how we are as human beings. We do not have the luxury of thinking we are separate. The devastation of the climate around the globe is evidence of our connectedness here on earth. I believe that connectedness extends way beyond our blue boat home. <coughs> Excuse me. In closing, I want to share yet another essay by the Black writer and performer, Aaron Freeman. 
This was written in 2006. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I love that physics is so religious. Listening to these Nobel Prize winning ultra materialists talk, you would think you were in church. Einstein spent half his life trying to prove that God doesn't play dice. Stephen Hawking says God not only plays dice, but rolls them where we cannot see. And this is even after Niels Bohr told them, physicists to, and I quote, stop telling God what to do. More recently, physicist Leon Lederman wrote a whole book about the God particle. Is this a physics lab or a revival tent? Physics and Judaism definitely share ideas. For example, both embrace monocreationism, that our universe was created and remained animated by a single all-powerful thing. Physicists call it energy of the Big Bang. Rabbis say the power of God, but they agree that all existence from Britney Spears' baby to Osama bin Laden's beard is powered by that one phenomenon. Physics and Judaism also have the same idea about the nature of God, which is, I don't know. A lot of us Jews don't even write out the word God. Instead, we write G-D, lest we delude ourselves that we even have the beginnings of an understanding of God's nature. Physicists are less comfortable with total ignorance, but insist on it anyway. Any proton pusher or beam jockey can show you beautiful math to explain what ha happened half a second after the Big Bang and paint you grand, elegant pictures of what has happened since. But the moment of the bang, the moment before it, their mathematics crumbles. Equations deliver nonsense. Physicists call their unknowable creator singularity. Both observant Jews and responsible physicists are required to behave with immense precision. And like it or not, they mostly don't. They must accept that God is not only stranger than they know, she is stranger than they can know. Maybe, Aaron Freeman writes, that's why there are so few physicists and so there are so many physicists and so few Jews. I wanna also offer gratitude for the Unitarian Universalist faith that does not have one sacred holy text with which we need to reinterpret, interpret, and argue about its meaning. No, our search for truth and meaning is expansive. Revelation is not sealed. In honor of all of us here together, connected, amen. Ashe and blessed be.